This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. Well, thank you so much for having me. I love podcasts and I love talking about my favourite music of all time. So let's go. <laughs> um, what got me into it? I think probably growing up in um, in a single parent home and being gifted a piano and that piano becoming my therapeutic way of dealing with growing up, I think. And uh, how... How old were you when you first played piano? Well, I'm definitely not more advanced than Phoebe from Friends. No, Ross from Friends on the um, keys. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but he's not the best. But <laughs> I love it. So I, I started probably around seven or eight and I never learned, you know, how to read music, but it just became a cathartic way of like being creative so you so you didn't learn to read you just you just kind of picked out stuff on the piano did you play along to records or did you just play stuff that you thought sounded good I just would would try and make chords and like um teach myself really and like mimic things that I'd heard uh from from yeah just from memory that's awesome and, and in terms of as as you've gone along have you then kind of got more formal with it or, or have you always kept that kind of like mystical side to it uh where you're just like focusing on what sounds good and on the melody yeah I think that because I didn't learn how to read it when I was young it looks to me like beautiful art that's impossible to read so I'm just like because I've gotten this far without doing it, I'm like, what's the point now? And there's always that theory that if you know too much, you can't let go. So I was just like, all right, I'm just gonna stay in my own weird element that doesn't quite make sense, but it's the easiest way for me to write. And I think also the amount of time it would take to learn to read, I'm scared to give up as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it seems totally unnecessary, but it's, something that I keep coming back to I don't know I just from having done podcasts with so many amazing people it's yeah. unbelievable like the amount of people in pop and like you know all the different offshoots soul R&B whatever uh, rock yeah. uh, no one really seems to read very few people unless they like arrange strings or something like that um, yeah. So, yeah it doesn't seem yeah. to be particularly useful but when did you decide that you kind of wanted to be a singer songwriter and you know pursue it professionally I always obsessively wrote it was like this gut instinct that I needed to just write things down and and make melodies whilst doing it um when I went to college none of my friends knew that I sung it was always this um I don't know, this secret, maybe because I think my mum didn't approve because she was, she's the Thai parent. And I think she was like worried that if I didn't do something academic, it was going to be less stable. Um, so I didn't really shout about it. And then I started doing um, talent shows at college. Um, and then that was where I met a friend who had this like studio that was based in East London that you could go to for free. It was it was for kids basically. And um, I'd go there and record. And then when I went to university, I'd travel back um, three hours on a coach just to do that. So it was like something that I was doing for the love of it, um, not knowing would it become a career, but obviously that was a dream. So I think when it started, I was graduating from university. So my whole life leading up to that, it was a hobby. It wasn't like a, oh, I'm going to be a, a pop star or anything. I just, it was just something I was doing all the time. That's, yeah. I mean, I guess that's 
the case for so many people who want to start out doing something creative, whether it's music or anything else, you're often going to have a parent or, I mean, what were your friends like as well? Cause that's always, um, you know, quite a thing, isn't it? With people who have big ambitions, especially with music, were your friends kind of saying, you know, you're going to be a huge singer songwriter or were they kind of keeping your feet on the ground by being a bit too realistic? Well, even they were surprised because for some of them, the first time they discovered that I sung was when I got on stage at college and they were like, oh, okay, she didn't tell us this. Um, I think everyone was trying to find their feet. And so they were sort of probably supportive and encouraging, but also like, well, what am I doing with my life? You know, so um, yeah, no one was saying you're going to be a star, but I think people knew she's got something with this voice you know they were like there's something special going on to so just keep going kind of thing and what was the initial turning point in terms of make giving you the confidence to think that you might be able to make it as a singer songwriter um well when i finished at university i was doing an acting degree um because, you know, at first I was going to do psychology and then last minute I changed my mind because I, I thought to myself, I'm only doing this because this is expected of me. And I was like, I, I need to do something where I can like build confidence on stage. So um, when I was graduating, I made a YouTube account and um, just sung some stuff that I'd written over some Neo Soul beats. And then... Um, Wiley, the godfather of grime, um, a UK rapper, just like started tweeting about it. So it was around then that a, a hobby that, that I happened to share on YouTube became a job possibility. Wow. And w were you a big fan of Wiley? He, I mean, he, yeah, he's obviously a legend in that scene, which is now kind of one of the dominant forces of like pop music especially in the UK but in general you know one of the forefathers of uh, such a great UK genre so was that like really exciting for you as a fan? Yeah it was mad because all of my uni friends were like you know this is the godfather of one like he's a legend and I was like yes I know what's going on and it was also quite random because I do like soulful music so you'd think in in a I don't know, idealistic world, it would have been someone like, imagine if it was like Stevie Wonder, like, yo, check out this singer. But it was, it was actually someone who maybe not everyone knew has such a love for soul singers. And like, he has yeah. been quite a co-signer of a lot of acts that have come through. Um, and he happened to be looking for a new singer to feature on his song at, at that time. Um, so yeah, I was chuffed. And I think, you know, no matter what sort of reputation Wiley has you know that he's notoriously known for not turning up to his video shoots and stuff he mm. is undeniably someone who put grime on the map so yeah I'm I'll always be so grateful for him I remember at the beginning he'd say can you stop saying thank you like you'd be here whether it was it was for me or not and <laughs> I'd just be like no it's you, thank you <laughs> yeah yeah well I mean he's a great artist and and like he's definitely done bad things uh, for sure. Uh, but it's like, you know, well, we keep on talking about on this podcast of, you know, separating the art from the artist, but also he's a human being. He has good parts and bad parts. And, yeah. you know, uh, it, it sounds like he was, a, a, in any case, a huge part in kind of, you know, giving you confidence when you were just starting out. So what yeah. what happened from there? Because, of course, like loads of people now will be hearing your albums. Um, but you know, this, the, the Wiley, um, thing happened back in like 2011, wasn't it? And your first album, like your first LP, like lessons in love, you know, that was eight years later. And, it, and that's pretty normal in the, in the industry. Cause like to make a full album is something that you've got to really work up to. Not many people get the chance. So what led to you releasing that amazing first album? Oh, thank you. Um, well, I'd say that for me, the, timing was due to so many different factors but mainly my own self-awareness and self-confidence um which took a really long time to to come at the beginning i would collaborate a lot more so it was like 
the Disclosure Collaboration, the Rudimental Collaboration, and then going on tour with Rudimental around the whole world and having people singing every lyric along with us. Um, to then go from that and in a way being able to hide in the background and just be on the waves of other artists doing what I did. I, um, I got really quite scared. Um, I remember when I first started performing on my own after this tour and, you know, it wasn't thousands of people screaming your lyrics because I was at the beginning. It was almost like I was exposed to so much um, fame because Rudimental were huge at the time. Um, and then I went back to the beginning again and I had to face up to who I was again. I couldn't, I wasn't hiding behind other um, other bands. So it really was a journey of like me needing to heal from past traumas and just, you know, we all come with our different demons and, and scars. And so getting from 2011 to 2019 was this, this journey of writing loads, writing with lots of different people, releasing a few bits here or there, thinking, oh yeah, that's me. And then, oh no, that's not. Um, and really it wasn't until I started learning the real lessons in love, which was like the biggest one for me was self-love that I could own it and actually start putting stuff out on my own. Um, so yeah, so I do think a lot of artists that I love, they've had long journeys too. And I think knowing that always helped me to keep going because if everyone's um, journey was overnight, I probably would have given up because it wasn't happening overnight for me. Well, I mean, you've definitely earned it because you've recently released, um, you know, very recently released, like six days ago, uh, Ready Is Always <laughs> Too Late. Uh, so, uh, so, and this album, like in my mind, has been a, even more of a step forward. When did you make it? Was this like a lockdown album? It kind of was. I So a lot of big things happened for me um, just before the lockdown. Um, I had a lot of realisations, a lot of um, discoveries about what boundaries I needed to set in my life. Um, relationships that were wrong and that I needed to leave behind and I decided at the end of 2019, right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to America where I feel that there's such a huge appetite for soulful um, music and R&B music. And um, I just kind of cleansed myself of anything that I felt was negative in my life. And it was like, yeah, come on, you're going to go and do it. And then the only time in my life where I had the guts to emigrate was the only time in my life that the world collapsed and everything ended. So it was like, <laughs> actually, no, I'm not going. You're gonna sit in your flat for months alone. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'd, I'd released, um, obviously, Lessons in Love. It had only been out for about uh, three months. And then it was like, what do I do now? Do I just do nothing or do I find a way to strengthen? So I, it was amazing because I got to say no to things because obviously we weren't allowed out and that meant that I got to know myself. So Ready Is Always Too Late was something that had already started without me knowing. And then when I eventually did make it to America, which ended up being August 2020, um, that's where I got to finish the album. So yeah, I'd say it was lockdown, but also destined to always come out um, as soon as possible after the last one. And actually, Sorry to harp on and on, but thinking about it, September 2019 to now is actually not that long. And I think no. the lockdown maybe gave me the time because I'm someone who finds it hard to say no, especially to the people that I love. It gave me the time to finish something uh, without any distractions. Yeah, I, I can imagine it must have been good for just getting everything, blocking the world away. Cause you know, whatever the demands are like socially, then there's also all of the business side and like gigs and you know, everything. And, and I mean, I'm sure there was stuff on zoom, but it's just, <laughs> yeah. Like everyday life, it can be pretty difficult uh, to write and make albums. 
what did you want to did you kind of set out with a plan or was it was it like kind of we've got enough for an album now and and then you decided to release it or did you sort of think at the start I'm going to sit down and you know maybe I'll end up with an album here and kind of set out to do it well when when the pandemic begun and like we were told that we weren't going anywhere it was probably March so by that point the album had been out for the first one had been out for about six months so I was actually still in the middle of promoting that and I'd started a tour which obviously stopped um I did like a remix to one of the songs and I was still pushing it but I also felt this gut instinct that because of the way that things were going it was time to just do something fresh rather than continually trying to find ways without touring to to build on what was already out. Um, it kind of felt like that chapter was done in a way. Um, so I think, yeah, as I said before, I did the video to a song with Masego and Van Jess called Stickin' and mm. that, that came out later in the year, last year. And it was like, hang on, this is definitely part of a new project. Like this is a new phase. I'm collaborating with people that I have to pinch myself to remind it did actually happen. You know, I love them. I love Johnny Venus of Earth Gang and I love Lucky Day. And it just felt like this was a new wave. So yeah, it it organically found its new home, which was album two. Um, and it wasn't until we've started talking about this that I've realized how quick that transition was. Um, but yeah, I, it just felt right. And why did you choose to move to LA? Um, like, was it was it a kind of thing of I'm done with London and I want <laughs> a new place and it's like LA is pretty cool? Or was it, you know, I'm, I've am i been to LA and I'm in love with it and, I, I, you know, I need to go there and, you know, screw London? <laughs> well, I'd been so many times for tours, for writing, that it wasn't a I'm falling in love with this place thing at all. It was a... I know this might sound a bit, um, I don't know, cheesy or whatever, but I really had a spiritual awakening at the end of 2019 when I realized my life will never, I will never evolve if I don't make these changes that I needed to make. Um, so it was like, for me last year, 2020 became this, you either, have you read The Alchemist? I've actually ordered a copy like a few months ago, but I ordered I ordered about forty books uh, like at Christmas, and I'm only about five through, which is pretty pathetic considering we're halfway through the year. That's really good, you know. But it would I've be still... all right in a normal year, but I just I went on this binge, uh, spent like hundreds of pounds on Amazon on all these books that are just sitting around. But yeah, yeah The Alchemist it's by Paulo Coelho, isn't it? Yeah, and in that book, which you'll learn, he talks about. Um, our purpose and like what we're destined to do and he just his analogy for that are the pyramids and you know whatever you feel your purpose on earth is you've got to go to it you've got to get to your pyramids so for me it just felt like I know that there's LA has this reputation of being very glamorous and oh my gosh everyone's vegan and everyone's got muscles <laughs> but it's also the hub of so many musicians and literally I just felt my gut tell me your pyramids are there you need to go and finish the album there and soak up you know all of the um, talent that you can so it, yeah it just felt like spiritually I, I, it was my calling well that that does sound like it's got a lot of sense to it and it doesn't sound like you've moved there for for the glamour and people do forget <laughs> that LA is although there'd be nothing wrong with that because it is an awesome city and the restaurants are good and all the rest of it and it is good to go to glamorous places and be like whoa but i mean I i'm doubting like 2020 was like peak glamour year in la given <laughs> that it was in one of the no. most stringent lockdowns in the entire us if not the most but it is the home of pop culture and people forget that and do you do you already feel like you've made the right decision especially now that like california's opening up and it must be a lot of fun well, I've become 
a grandma um, in recent years. So I actually don't do much partying. Um, I get more satisfaction from like, as you said, reading my book and like seizing the day and getting up early and having a routine. So the, the glamour side of it isn't, um, isn't something that I'm drawn to. Obviously I'm very grateful for the nature, the fact that California is huge and, and there's so much to see in America um, and there are beaches and things. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm grateful, but I definitely feel like it's, it's for work. And there's the other side to it too, which is really sad. Um, how the poor are here and how people mm. with no homes are and the fact that they don't have the NHS and things like that. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in these, you know, air quotes, glamorous places. And I think the pandemic had a really terrible impact on the homeless. Um, and I would feel really, you know, I'm, I'm a Libra, so I'm, I'm typically empathetic, but I'd feel a bit weird about like, going to the studio and, and like singing a song and outside I could see someone, you know, with a tent for a home and they've, they've got a guitar and I'd be like, this is wrong. Like, why is, it's almost like a ghost town because the homeless people mm. walk around and people that are okay and, and well off walk around too. And they don't, sort of don't acknowledge each other. Um, but anyway, bit of a tangent, I guess. No, everywhere. but it's really, it's a really worrying thing. Like uh, from what I hear, the homeless thing has been a huge, um, like a really bad problem, like since the pandemic started and what makes it all the more concerning is obviously LA is full of like the richest people in the world living in like mansions in Bel Air and all the rest of it. You know, the, the discrepancy, it's like a kind of tin pot dictatorship in the sense that like the the have nots are so much worse off than the rich in um, yeah in california but but hopefully something can be done about it yeah exactly i mean that's the thing when you when how i feel about however humble my platform is i definitely learned from last year that i'm not just here to to push out music. I'm also here to spread awareness or help in any way possible. I think that last year really helped a lot of us activate our activism, you know, and, and like see that this is about us, not, not I. And I definitely think, you know, there were a lot of great shows going on that, that were spreading awareness about what we're doing to our planet and stuff like that. And I'd be like, wow, I want to do that sort of stuff. Like, I, that that fulfills me as much as doing a tour for this album would. And so, yeah. and who are some of the people in, you know, in showbiz, in pop music, uh, or in LA, you know, who you find quite inspiring in terms of activism and and kind of doing stuff above and beyond what they need to. I always joke around about um, how we can't leave Leonardo DiCaprio to do it all on his own. <laughs> um <laughs> obviously his instagram is all about the planet um but uh, that's such a good question um which i really need to think about i know that the global citizen awards show um or the global citizen society i can't remember what they're called there are a lot of artists who have performed um, for that platform and, you know- Was that the one doing... at the start of lockdown? I think so, yeah. Yeah, where they did all of those those home performances and stuff. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Some people who yeah. you don't see often really got out, like you don't see Stevie Wonder doing that much these days. And he did great versions. I can't remember what he played, but it was, it was amazing. I think it was like Love's In Need Of Love Today or something like that, uh, just at home. Yeah. And he's never making yeah. media appearances. Yeah, exactly. And I know that um, Marina and the Diamonds had done some beach cleanups and, and promoted that on her page. Um, so yeah, that's a really good question. I'd actually like to find that out myself because maybe I could team up with some people. I know that a lot of um, artists do share, you know, about um, problems that have happened. I remember, you know, when 
there were fires here in LA and fires in the Amazon forest and, and stuff like a friend of mine, Jess Glynn was, was talking about it and trying to raise money. So yeah, it's something that I think a lot of people are thinking about. And then it's just the question of when's the next like celebration or awareness um, day for that. I know there's Earth Day as well. So maybe I need to do something then. Well, yeah, when's Earth Day? I can't remember when Earth Day is. But I think I to find in out. March, and I in will March. tell you. <laughs> it's on the, no, it's April 22nd. <laughs> But I mean, it, it is true that there, there is a lot of activism that goes on, but hopefully they, they can, like whoever is in charge in California can stop the homeless stuff because it seems so ridiculous given how expensive LA is and like how full of like rich people it is that, that there are people on the streets like that. It's like not what you would think of. Um, yeah. But, but I mean, I'm sure something will be done if, if there's a if there's a god or, or or whatever the expression would be but i wanted to to on a brighter note talk about yeah. um, some of your favorite music because obviously you've moved to a place that's going to be deeply inspiring musically what you know what would you say is the greatest music of all time f for you well i had to think about five of my favorite songs and it wasn't easy because you never want to miss anyone out but I obviously have so many artists that I love um, that I would like to mention too, but when you think about the greatest songs, one that came to mind first was um, Donny Hathaway's A Song For You. Mm. And it, I just, to me, it's timeless. The chords are like punches to the stomach in the best way, like heart string pullers. Um, so yeah, so that's my first one. That's an amazing song. Donny Hathaway is such a, an incredible singer. And also I think it was originally written by, uh, uh, by Leon Russell. Do you know, do you know who I mean by that? I don't, but I'm going to research right now. He's pretty cool. Leon Russell. He was, uh, like a kind of, uh, well, he was a piano player and songwriter and he was in the wrecking crew, like the group of sixties LA session musicians who played on all the beach boys stuff and Frank Sinatra stuff and right. loads of other stuff. And he like wrote that song for his solo career, but he was, he was kind of not doing that well. And then he did like a reunion album with Elton John and that mm -hmm. put him back yeah. on the map. Um, but he passed away a couple of years ago, but he's a legend. And so D Donny Hathaway co covered that. And that, I mean, his songs, his version of it's probably my favorite. But there's also a Ray Charles version of a song for you as well, which is pretty good. Wow, you know your stuff. Of course you must, but. No, I mean, I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd, but to be honest, like I bet you some of the other songs, I I mean, it's always it's always interesting when, when um, you know, someone says a song and I have no idea, but I always yeah. like listening to them. So what would song number two be? Um, well, I was just going to say, because um, I've done some research, Russell not only sings and plays piano on the recording, but also plays the tenor horn that is accompanying. Um, and then, as you said, Elton John, did he cover it? Uh, I think because they did some gigs together, Leon Russell um, and Elton John, and I saw them at the Roundhouse. But I think Leon Russell just played a song for you by himself. Okay. He, got, he, he was kind of being put in all these major venues again because before that album when they reunited uh mm. he was literally playing like bars and stuff and like had right. like a beat up old tour bus and then they did this new album produced by t-bone burnett and uh yeah it was it was wicked it was such a good album i think speaking of elton it reminded me that your song is one of the best songs as well yeah i mean that's that is an unbelievable song. So early yeah. in his career as well. Yeah. It Elton's like, like low key a friend of mine. I've decided he's my friend because he <laughs> told people to listen to this new album. But wow. yeah, that that tune, I literally, it, why it hit me so hard that he'd mentioned my album is that your song became my lockdown like hobby, like to learn how to play it obviously from ear, not from music. And 
I don't know, he's just a legend. But yeah, we have to say that song next. How how was um, how was learning to play that tune by ear? Because it's is it is that a difficult thing to do on piano? Or it's not like so sat- like it was just so satisfying because it's like every chord is just like oh like it was easy because I just loved it. Like it didn't matter how long it would take. I need to get a keyboard over here because my keyboard's at home in London. Um because I want to, I want to sing it and and like show him. <laughs> oh yeah, I bet he'd love. I bet he'd love that. Um, the the uh, yeah, it's good that he he promotes uh, on the whole your album definitely included uh, very good music by like younger artists because there are a lot of kind of vintage artists who aren't like that fussed about doing it and I guess it you know it really helps. Um, so that's awesome that he that he praised your album. Uh, and that song is, yeah, I mean, it's a masterpiece, but like Elton yeah. and the Beatles are definitely in my hall of fame. So you, oh, would, need, you would need no, and, and same with Donny Hathaway. Uh, these have been very good choices so far. So what's choice number three? Okay, number three, we're going to go for Amy Winehouse, Wake Up Alone. All right. Okay. So what album is that? I will have heard that, but what album is that from? Is it from Back to Black or Frank? Back to Black. Yeah. Back to Black. Back to Black. Yeah, that is, I mean, I, I I can't recall that song specifically. Why that song specifically? You will, you'll know, okay? I, I will know. I've heard the album so many times, but it's been, it's to, been a while. I need to read you just some of the lyrics, just to like, it might make you cry. When she says, <laughs> um, you know, it's okay in the day I'm staying busy, tied up enough so I don't have to wonder where is he. Got so sick of crying, so just lately when I catch myself, I do a 180. Ah, oh, she's too much. And then she's like, pour myself over him, moon spilling in, and I wake up alone. For me, the lyricism of Amy is just like, Sometimes I think, how are we all just walking around our days knowing that these songs exist? Mm. It's just incredible. No, I feel the same way. Uh, when you like a song so much and you like a lyric and you you kind of see someone's like beauty and creativ- creativity to that extent, when you know the lyrics and then, you know, you almost feel, well, I definitely feel annoyed with my, uh, my mates, some of whom have a quite questionable taste in music. <laughs> Like, for God's sake, yeah. you know, listen to this music. Uh, but uh, so that uh, that song, like, and Amy's music, did you get into it right around the time that it was released? I didn't. I actually, I, I obviously was into her when she was around um, and back then, but it was like the older I grew up, the harder the lyrics hit um, because then I was experiencing heartbreak and... I was feeling emotions that she was talking about. It was like when she was around, I almost wasn't as aware of my emotions, I guess. I was still in the running away phase, you know, finding the vices phase. Um, (laughs) So I actually got more into her the longer that the music was around because I was then growing up and feeling those things too. Yeah, I mean, Frank, especially, like, did you get into that first album? Like, like That's later on? My, yeah. That is literally my heart. Like, that album is too much stronger than me. Like, just the balls of the woman as well. Like, how can <laughs> you write a song about a, just be a man? Like, in that song, I just love it. She just, she touched on subjects that maybe people that I had listened to hadn't touched on in, in such a way. And like, she managed to say things so simply and yet so poetically with balls. It was just a new wave that I was here for. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I guess around the time that she came out, I wasn't listening that much. It's been since as well, but the the legacy of only two albums, I mean, imagine what she would have achieved. Have you, have you seen that documentary on Netflix about her? Uh, I have seen her documentary, yeah. That's so good, isn't it? Like yeah. that. It's called, I, I think it's just called Amy. Um, but it's really sad yeah. as well to see 
you know, how much she was kind of just addicted to boozing and everything. Um, such yeah. a loss. It is, and I, I saw the Whitney documentary as well, and oh, yeah. what, what rings true with both of them is that they were just so overworked, and in a way, the, the self-care was just, there was no time for that. It was like, right, got to do another tour. Come on, let's go, go, go. And it's weird because I got really emotional watching both of, of their stories, because um, you just think, oh, what if... What mm. if this had happened? And it's just sad because talent often goes too soon. Um, but yeah, I wonder what, you know, she definitely would have been carried on being one of the greats of our time. Um, yeah, it's great that she do... made real music as well, like in the charts, but it was, I mean, that sounds like a snobby thing to say, but it was like the antithesis to, to overproduced stuff. That's for sure. It was like really raw. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was amazing. W what's choice number four? So I've actually got six, so it's quite hard for me to to leave someone out. But next, I'm oh, going to you say can do, you can do six. <laughs> oh, yay! We're not we're not strict. We're not. <laughs> I love it. I, I'm always like, oh gosh, I've got to stick to the rules. Um, next, I'm going to go for Coldplay, The Scientist. Hmm. That is a great tune. And I mean, I was about to say uh, I that's like by far my favorite kind of era of Coldplay. Like, is, is that the case for you or have you kind of kept going? Like for me, I stopped listening around like X and Y or Viva La Vida. But like basically when they became a bit of dancey, that wasn't so much. Yeah, I think the new era Coldplay, my favorite song is probably Magic. I find that oh, quite yeah. Easy. Um, but I, I'm the same as you. I'm, I'm quite a. When I was growing up, and and there was a lot of, um, I felt a lot of expectation that I, I didn't feel I was meeting um, f towards the the East Asian expectations that my mum had of of like doing something academic, and you know it was quite a strict upbringing. That I found myself drawn to the first two Coldplay albums so young and thinking, oh, my friends are doing like, what would have been then TikTok trendy dancing to these pop songs. And there I was sort of like sitting in my room, like staring at the walls, listening to clocks and, um, you know, uh, yellow and, and things like that and being like, what's going on? But it obviously was my way of, of dealing with all of the things that I was feeling. Um, so yeah, so the early era is the real whew, heart grabber for me. Um, and then there's just been a few like perils of that same energy in the modern stuff. But you're right, there's a lot more pop, dancey, faster stuff that wasn't as, it, it was still amazing, but it just wasn't my favorite Coldplay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's like, they're still, he's, well, Chris Martin in particular, obviously genius. being the kind of songwriter, is a genius. I think it's just a question of being a pragmatist, probably, that he sees like where the sound's going. So he's not like following it. But Magic, that was a good point. That was kind of like better than like Viva La Vida. That was really one of the best songs because of the story as well, because it was about how he was, you know, getting divorced, but still, you know, loved, um, loved his wife. So I thought that was quite a quite a you know heartbreaking thing to do write a song yeah. and you know you're, what, you're just what magic's about. yeah it was because he wrote it you know about Gwyneth Paltrow even though they were getting divorced uh, right. so to write a love song about someone who you're splitting up with you know I mean I know people take the piss out of them because they describe getting divorced as like conscious uncoupling and you know uh, but, but uh, that's an open goal to take the piss out of you know what what's actually the case is that the song is a you know, it is a lovely song. It's such a great um, melody. And The mm. Scientist, was that one of the songs that you would have early um, <laughs> played piano to, like, as you were, like, learning stuff? I don't, I don't think I ever did that one on the piano. Really? Um, <laughs> I didn't. I'm not sure why, but I just remember the drop. And when I say mm. the drop, of course, I'm not talking about um, drum and bass. I just mean, like, the way that it just, it kind of sounds like, 
peanuts hitting each other and even though it's not I think it's a rim shot but just that it's such a beautiful drop that comes in on the second verse that all of that tension leading up to that point you're just like whoa and yeah. for me I just he captures the devastatingly beautiful and painful thing that we call life you know there's so many different ups and downs and yeah that that song to me is just perfection and so it had to be a contender for this yeah yeah you're absolutely right and yeah when when the drums and bass come in like that is it's such a well-arranged tune um yeah a, a very good choice so what's number five you're on a roll here <laughs> thank you so five we're gonna take it back to the classics and we're gonna do al green how can you mend a broken heart Ooh. um yeah story behind this one is um i got onto a flight to go and meet someone who i'd been speaking to for like three months and we hadn't seen each other in real life and this song came on on the plane and i thought wow this this because normally you hear weird music on, on when you get into an airplane, but I thought this airline's bringing some heat today. And it came <laughs> on and I was on the phone to this guy and I was like, wow, like I'm about to. And then so I quickly downloaded it and listened to it a lot on the way home. And, and then I've noticed it's in a lot of films and it's just so, oh, again, the chords just hit my soul. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing song. You know, it's a Bee Gees song originally. Is it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Al Green like is oh. is a better singer in my view. Uh, well, I mean, there's not many people that he's not a better singer than. He's one of the best of all time. But uh, How yeah, did a broken heart by the Bee Gees. Oh my gosh! What? So they both they all went ah, in that in that. Oh my gosh! This is. I don't think they would. Story. I don't think they would have sung it like Al Al Green. Um, oh, okay, I'm gonna watch it after this. Like their their version's gonna it, it's a lot more like straight. It's le much less soulful, but it's still gr right. a great tune. And uh, yeah. I, you know, I was <laughs> sorry for being such a <laughs> such a nerd. Uh, but so so I song number it. six. I think your your nerdism is just <laughs> boding so well with mine. Um, so lastly. Now I'm going for, for the Queen Lauren Hill. And the reason mm. I've gone for this song is because even though there are more obvious classics that are more well known, I thought, let me just get a little bit um, mystical with this one. Let me go for something that hits me as much, but maybe doesn't get as much heat. So this one is, I find it hard to say. Um, and she performed this on her MTV Unplugged show many years ago. And again, I just was like, this is soul on a sleeve in a song. Um, and she's accompanying herself, which is something that always moved me so much when Amy did it. And I know that Amy was a huge Lauren fan. So, yeah, mm. that's my sixth choice. Is that, is that song on, on Miss Education of Lauren Hill? No, oh, it was just on the MTV Unplugged show. Oh, right. Okay, I'm going to have to Google that and watch that. And and so the MTV Unplugged show as well, I haven't seen that. Uh, oh. what, what's she playing? What, just guitar and singing? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you mentioned that album, Miss Education, Zion, um, you know, her cover of You're Just Too Good To Be True, and then X Factor, I mean... We've got, yeah, let's just make some noise for that album as well. <laughs> yeah, it's such an amazing album. That does get brought up a lot, like if people do albums. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, quite rightly, what a legend. Uh, legend. What amazing choices that, uh, that you've made. Uh, it was a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much, Sinead. And to Thanks, all the Tom. listeners, check out Ready is Always Too Late, uh, the absolutely superb new album. Um, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your year. I'm sure like you'll be, will you be on the road at some point or playing gigs? Or will that be next year? Well, let's see what happens. Making plans is quite hard right now, but there is a tour in the works. Well, fingers crossed it can all go ahead and everybody can continue 
hopefully getting vaccinated and back to normal. But yeah, in the meantime, hope all goes well in LA with uh, and with promoting the album. Um, yeah, it's such a great one. Thank so thanks you. so much. Thank and you for teaching so many things. Have a great day. <laughs> yeah. Do you sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night? I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. If you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.